For many, this heat, dust, and isolation remain the perception of agriculture. However, in the 21st century, agriculture is an exciting high-tech sector that feeds the world. Katleko, thank you for coming and chat to us. It was quite a short notice, but we've been chatting for a while on social media. Mm -hmm. um, we have found you on Instagram, and it was the name that caught my eye. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> was Legal Buddha, I see. Yes. <laughs> so, and <laughs> I wouldn't say it's misleading, but I think a lot of people <laughs> click on that because they're thinking something else. <laughs> no, definitely. And I think that's what's fun about it, um, that I wanted to create interest. And then when you do click on it, you find me, a black yes. woman, right? And then obviously I the first thought is, how is how does she know? <laughs> you I, know only, and, I only found out that you were a black lady. Yeah. When you sent me because I inbox says what's your name? Mm. That's mm -hmm. what I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I think yeah, so the name, you know, it was a, a funny joke between me and a friend of mine because she's like, you can't do that. You can't call yourself the Buddha Macy. And I'm like, why not? You know, I'm I'm a lawyer and I specialize in agricultural law, so I am the legal Buddha Macy because that's all I do. You know, it's yeah. it's only agriculture that our firm does we do not touch any other aspect of of the law um so it's a perfect name you know and it works out and actually it it is an icebreaker as well you know because a lot of people do not expect it and given the fact that obviously our agricultural sector is predominantly white they don't expect me you know when yes. they come so a lot of the reaction i've got is actually laughter you know when they they figure it out and they would they yes. see my face or they see my name and they laugh and they're like you're very funny and it makes me more interesting you know then they want to hear um what else do I have to say? You know, what do I know about farming if I'm going to call myself um, a Buddha Macy? You exactly. know, but I also think exactly. being a Buddha Macy is a South African thing. You know, like, I, you know, it's, uh, just because it's not my first language doesn't mean that it's not part of my culture as well, because um, the Afrikaans language, any other language in this country is all ours, you know, and the ability to speak Afrikaans, which I can, um, allows me to call myself Buddha Macy if I want to, just like anybody else, maybe from a different culture, can give their child an English or Zwana name or a Zulu name if they want to. Nothing is, is stopping it and nothing is, I think, controversial about it. We are all South Africans and, you know, our languages belong to all of us, you know, so that's where that that came from. So so I think for the people who are interested in the legal Buddha, Masi, who are you? <laughs> Okay, so my name is Katla Hongwane, but everybody calls me Katli for short. It's like a, a baby nickname that's stuck. So, so I'm still Katli to everyone that knows me. I'm originally actually from Rustenburg, right? Mm -hmm. So I should have maybe called myself the mining girl because I grew up around a lot of mines and my family's in the mining industry. Um, I studied law in Pretoria. And then after that, I did my postgrad in business administration at Hendley in Johannesburg. And then I sort of kind of, you know, when I was doing law, my mom said to me at the time, you really need to find something no no one else is doing. So please do not do family law and, and or specialize in something that will guarantee a job, you know, because at the moment we have a lot of lawyers with no jobs. You know, everybody's got an LLB, but does not have a job. And a lot of them struggle to even find articles and, and, and so on and so forth. So I then chose sustainable development as a as a elective and I took environmental law and then I also took forensic law which has got nothing to do with agriculture but it was just an interest of mine to figure out how people die <laughs> you know <laughs> but um, with the sustainable development at the time the textbook was so thin all right because South Africa that we've always had environmental laws and water laws and you know sort of a system of sorts of how it works but never as advanced as the rest of the world in terms of how do you balance um people's human rights to 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 have a good environment around them and protect the environment for future generations but also the need for industry industries like agriculture or mining and all of that we've we didn't have that you know and it's in recent times when i say recent i'm saying maybe the last 20 years or so you're seeing all these acts um being put into place by the government trying to to manage you know the the two that i'm talking about that how do you continue an industry but also make sure that the environment is safe um to live in and is 
it's it's it carries on for future generations so um then long story short i have a very good lawyer friend that lives in pal um, and during the the day zero days where um cape town western cape was having a water problem he called me and he said listen i've got this water thing with these farmers right and i just don't know enough about it you know so you're the only one if i remember that can um speak on this can you come and i'm like i will i don't know paul i've never seen paul i don't know paul and it sounds like it's terrible right <laughs> and um he said to me look i'm not saying you should move here i'm saying fly down i'll pay for your hotel and just come consult for me and you know you go back and forth and so i started coming um my first day in Pa wasn't great, right? Uh, I got here. Pa is a weird place for people very, that, that's not from here. It's a very weird place for people that are not from here, you know? And I think my first um, experience, I was meeting at a coffee shop because I don't know Pa. So he's going to, he said to me, go to this coffee shop. I'll find you there and I'll, you know, I'll bring you to my office. So as I was, when I got to the coffee shop, I'm standing there. It says, please wait to be seated. So I wait to be seated. And this lady comes to me and says, we're not hiring. And I was oh. like, excuse me, do I look like I'm looking for a job? <laughs> right? um, and already then that sort of gave me a little bit of a negativity about Paul, yeah. you know, that I already was scared of, right? Obviously doing some research mm -hmm. before I arrived that, oh, okay, it's the home of Afrikaans, you know, and therefore the racism must be out of this world you know it's a small town you know so i'm comparing it now to maybe someone in the free state you know all those rumors you hear of these little towns or dorpies that are hectically racist or perceived to be you know and not saying that everybody in a certain dorp will be racist but you know you you then have this bias immediately you know and think to yourself no this is not the place for me i don't have time for this nonsense because i'm from joburg we don't have yeah. these problems anymore in joburg of you know there's places you can or cannot go or you feel unsafe or uncomfortable um but that was my first experience with paul like my the first person i spoke to in paul asked me if i i'm looking for a job when i said that Technically, yes, you were, but Technically, not but I didn't ask for the job. I was called, yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, but I mean, yes. So that's what happened, and um, she's apologized since profusely because I'm not, I've been here now six years, you know. So I'm I'm very much part of the culture and the fabric um, of Pal. So every time she sees me, she goes red, right? And I'm like, it's okay, you know, like it's you know maybe you were hiring that day so you thought you had an interview coming yeah. and whatever it's a, it can be explained sometimes without going too far and saying it was a racist um incident and then also i'm not that sensitive when it comes to um jumping on the bandwagon of race baiting or saying every single incident is a racial incident just because the person has a different um, skin color to my to my own mm -hmm. so but i think that comes with probably being in Joburg for so long, having so many white friends, I'm married to a white man. Um, so I don't see it the same way. You know, I'm not saying racism doesn't exist. And I'm not saying that race or color doesn't exist. Of course, I see color, you know, but I'm just not as sensitive that every single thing just because I'm black or I don't get my way must be because somebody is being ugly to me from a racial perspective. OK, so then you came to Paul. Mm -hmm. So I ended up living here, oh, well, yeah, back and forth with consultations. And then I thought to myself, no, this looks like a business, you know, because farmers are very interesting that way. You help one farmer do a good job. Yes. He tells his friend yes. next door, you know, and so I started getting calls outside of my my law firm that was originally the one that called me to come help their clients, you know, and I found myself so many, so many times here more than I was at home. And at that time, our son was only two, three years old. So I felt like, okay, there's a decision to be made and there's an opportunity here for me. Um, and we just have to find somewhere to stay because I'm certainly not staying in town. <laughs> I don't want to stay in Paul, right? Um, so he helped me. His name is Willem van Heerd and he's actually a partner. He's just up the road here. He helped me find a place and get settled. So we moved. Um, I registered my business, you know. It's so literally a brand new business, registered it um, and got going you know, got offices, um, serve, um, shared offices there at Workshop 17 and hired people and the rest is wow, history, as they say. That's very cool. Amazing how a niche, you, you, you are completely unaware of it and then you tap into it slowly and then it pulls, then pulls you in lock, stock and barrel. And then there's a huge need at which you have now found and you're filling that. Mm. So, mm. I mean, agricultural water is a big thing. I mean, because without water, 
You don't There's have nothing. a farm. You don't yeah, have don't. a life. But but, it, but if you say agricultural law, so what is what what falls under the agricultural law portfolio for yeah. Because I can just just sitting here thinking there's there's plenty. There's mm, mm. HR. There's mm, mm. Uh, buying, selling yeah. land. All what, mm. what what falls under your mm. portfolio? So. Okay, so obviously with buying and selling land, that's conveyances. I'm not a conveyancer. So you would go to a normal law firm. They can do it. It's, you know, there's not much of a difference between an agricultural property and a residential property in terms of conveyancing. But if you're doing things like, um, so conveyancing though, they will come to me and say, okay, but you need to look at this in terms of water rights, in terms of what rights does the buyer have, you know, um, when acquiring this land or what guarantees the seller has to have to give to the buyer in terms of buying this property because the next guy probably also wants to continue farming, but he needs to know that the previous guy has all his compliance in place and he's not going to be le left with a big mess. Absolutely. And then, then it goes into occupiers, you know, who lives on that farm, all right? A lot of farmers don't even know how many people are on their property. And it's not just not just their workers, it's family members, randoms, children, um, you know, people that just disappeared onto the farm, you know, because he's running away from something in Cape Town, you know, and that's where the drug issue and the criminal issues and um, elements come in, you know. So then there's the, the next part of what I do, you know, like that, who's on your farm? Do you know? You know, especially your mega growers with large swaths of property, they don't keep up, you know. So you'll say to them, how many people on your farm? You say, yeah, well, I know about five, six families, you know, but you're talking five, six families for about three generations. So from his grandfather's time. You know, but that five, six families has now become 15 or 20 because somewhere or another, they're all related and they keep marrying and then children and then this and this that. So, you know, you, you, you end up with what you think is 40 is actually a hundred, you know, um, of, of that, you know. Well, and you know that's, how many is on his payroll that yeah, get, get paid? Yeah, to compa yeah, compared to what actually is on his payroll. So they like to look at their payroll and say, I've got 40 people living on the farm. Actually, it's a hundred because you didn't count the girlfriend, the cousin, the whoever that's now came to, came to stay on the farm and never left, you know, because you don't have what we call effective control over your farm. Mm -hmm. And that can cause very big issues, issues when you want to sell. A lot of farms that are not selling, they don't care. They say, well, we'll manage it. It's fine. You know, but when you want to sell, it becomes an issue because the next guy doesn't want your problems, you know, because yes. they're your historical problems. It was your dad and your grandfather that knew that family. And some people don't want to hire those mm. people. They want to maybe bring in their own people, you know, onto the farm. They want more space in terms of housing, you know, so they want those people out of those, those houses. And that's where we get to evictions, right? And what is a, a fair eviction and what's not, you know, and that's also very controversial within agriculture culture because the farmer is also a businessman you know so for him he needs that space for younger workers you know for yes. people that are actually productive on his farm so he can't have old people there but the law also says if they're old you can't kick them out they've got life rights they must die there you know because um what, what where they're supposed to go you know and finding solutions around that and if you can tell all of those things have nothing to do with court Right. These are all solutions we must find. Um, we can't go to courts, but that could take forever. And our, our judges are constitutional judges, right? They, they're not happy to evict anybody, you know, without knowing where those people are going, you know, without mm -hmm. some sort of fairness mm -hmm. to those people. So the days of going to court to get an eviction, um, order are gone because you're probably not going to get it and it's a lot of money as well you know because then you're paying advocates and all sorts of other charges you know to 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 do it so we have to find fair solutions right alternative solutions what do we do with our old people what do we do with their children what do we do with babies um that are born on the farm you know and how do we make sure that it's fair to the farmer but it's also fair to them because we know we can't just um kick them out and that would be sort of my job also to find solutions to that and suggest um solutions most farmers are not terrible people they don't want to kick yeah. anybody out but it's becoming unsustainable you know but, but, and but it's long time not a farm anymore it's a business mm, exactly it, it, it is it is the the what's happening on the farm is farming yes but it's a full-run business exactly. because the sons and mm. the daughters are no longer just falling in working mm. in the field mm. they are cas they probably some of them have got legal degrees yeah. and but they're also part of the business mm, mm, to keep the things in mm, house. 
No, but that's the thing, you know, and I think that's where people also, you know, these organize. we've got organizations, you know, especially here in the Western Cape that are quite aggressive, quite violent about these evictions. And, you know, they'll, you know, I've had my experience of them marching in front of my office because I'm part of the problem and whatever the case might be. And what they fail to understand is that, you know, this is a business. This is not just some land, you know, that somebody is just being ugly and wanting to take people off. You know, he just wants to be productive in his business and ensure success you know mm. and half the time we also find that some of the occupiers as we call them um do not necessarily want to work for the farmer right it's just a free place to stay you know so some of them will leave for three months and go to cape town and then be back again you know three months later you know some will keep the house they have a girlfriend there and he's off mm. Elsewhere, oh, he's working at the farm next door. He's not working here. So he's not being fair to the farmer because what is the farmer getting back for giving you free accommodation? And let's be honest, most of it is free accommodation, free water, free electricity um, and all of that because the farmers, again, now the next part of the law that I have to deal with or what I, I part of my umbrella is that farmers have to um, comply with certain housing requirements and all of that in order to, Im um, to export their products, yes. right? Some countries will not take um, products from, from farmers that they feel are abusing their people, you know, or if people look like they are living still in slavery or in, in, in very bad things. So the farmer actually has to pay anyway and fix those homes and make it look nice and, and all of that. And some of these homes are very nice, you know, very comfortable fireplace inside, you know, electricity metered, of course, water and all of that. But that costs money, you know, and it's not money coming out of the occupier's um, pocket. It's coming out of the business, you know, because yes. he has to do it also to comply um, with, with the rules of, of export and and so on you know so wow, it's a i think this is a whole minefield that, that has, <laughs> and they have to, they the discussion have to on its own <laughs> they have to comply with all those ethical audits yes. that are set in place yeah the for, vita the caesar yes. global gap all of that you know and, so. and those are those are expensive for the farmer mm. to do mm. and the point is as you say um there's the sort of historical thing where a farm is a place where you, where you and your family can live, mm. but it, it's actually a business. So there mm. is the clash of two different ideologies mm. there, mm. which I'm sure you've, as you say, if you've, people have been marching outside your office, mm. you've obviously come, ac you've come across no, I've that. I've come across it. Look, I don't, I don't um, dispute, mm. and I always say this to people, that the most vulnerable group of people for me are farm workers in this country, mm. right? And farm dwellers, right? Why? Because of the history of our country and the history of agriculture, they don't have anywhere else they call home but the farms because generationally, mm. they've been with the same family, if you want to call it that, for five, six generations. I mean, when we do these orders, you can actually do a family tree. You know, once you get all their names, you can see the family tree and who's, who's uncle and mother and father and who, who's cousins and, and all of that. They don't have anywhere to go. So also on the other side, I feel bad for them. And I say, guys, think about it, you know, where are they going to go, right? They've never lived in a township. They've never lived in town and they are scared. You know, they are scared of the township because they don't know the culture of a township because a township is like a big city in a way. You know, you need to know, um, you know, the, the mood of the place. You need to know which corner not to go to. You need to know who lives there and who lives there. So if you move a whole group, you know, into the township randomly, they are very vulnerable to all sorts mm -hmm. of things, you know. And a lot of them also are scared for their children, you know, because on the farm, the farmer protects them from drugs and um you know, drug abuse, alcohol abuse, all of that stuff, there is some protection for the, the younger kids to not be exposed to that as yet. They remain innocent for a long time versus kids in the township or kids living in town are smarter for like, or, or the more streetwise um, than kids that are on the farm. So you understand the vulnerability, you understand the fears and the concerns um, that they have. So we have to find a solution for that. It's not that easy to just transplant them from one way of living. And, you know, because they are also far I'm thinking, you know, into some sort of city life, even if you're talking about Paul, you know, and Paul is a small town, but for them, it's a lot. Yes, you know? of course. It's, it's overwhelming. So I would try to find solutions for stuff like that. So 
some of the solutions we'll find is that we'll say to the farmer, okay, and he also gets it, you know, because I like to explain to my clients that, listen, these guys are very vulnerable, you know, so I know it upsets you. I know you're frustrated and, and all of that, but we have to find a balance, you know, and going to court, you probably won't get it. So we, we have to work together now to find a solution, you know, so it's either you keep them and we manage it properly, you know, so there's a housing um, association, like, you know, you form sort of like an HOA, you know, or a body, co a body corporate, for example example and um, where they almost have rules and they sign to rules and if rules are broken immediately there's consequences to it and and all of that mm. and that's what we call effective control and there's a gate you know and if you have a visitor you must notify the visitor stays too too long he must pay an insla foy you know, right and the insla foy comes off the salary of the one that's working and we found little measures like that if the farmers who choose that they stay do actually work because they start self-governing Right. Mm. And the self self managing, you know, and if you give them the responsibility of self to say, listen, otherwise we have to do some sort of eviction process because it can't carry on like this. They start reporting on themselves. They start getting rid of the bad um, elements within their, their community because they are invested now. You know, and they want to and stay they're empowered because and they're empowered because they are laws. Mm. Mm. And, and, and a lot of these big growers. It's like a small little town that they've got to. No, and, they and run a town. <laughs> yes. So, so they must yeah. run a business. Yeah. And they must run a and town. And they must manage a town, yeah. And run a family. Mm. And... Oh, no, it's a lot, but I think that's the thing. And a lot of these bigger growers, especially in your very rural areas, I mean, let's let's talk about, let's say, your Fiat and Dow area, right? That's quite far, you know? There's not much going on there. So you almost don't have a choice but to have your people live on your farm anyway, yeah. you know? So a lot of farmers then make the mistake of just not controlling it properly, you know, not putting in the rules, not exercising the consequences of behavior, you know? If somebody steals at work, you fire them, but why don't you evict them from your farm? Why are you leaving them on yeah, the farm? You know, it should go together, you know? And, you know, so little things mm -hmm. like that where farmers get a bit lax um, with that and then they end up with a problem, you know? Um, but those that, you know, follow and we give them advice of how to do it and we, we manage it, you know, we help them manage it properly, find it to be quite successful, you know, and then it works because mm. they self-govern, right? And they, they, um, they have pride, they have a sense of dignity, you know, the empowerment gives them dignity, you know. Um, and then those that really are desperate to have people off the farm, we will suggest things like, can't we find a piece of land somewhere? Um, and move them there, you know, to form their own community, their own um, township. A lot of them will be on RDP lists um, with the government. So the government actually allows us to, the Department of Housing, or Housing Settlements, or House Settlements, whatever, um, they allow actually that if, if the farmer agrees. So I'll say to the farmer, okay, will you please buy this person a property? All right, the property, depending on the area, let's say it's about 170,000 rents. Right. And then the RDP, they are on the list to get it, but government doesn't have enough land to build the RDPs, but the money is there. So we are able to then say to settlement, get them off the list because we bought them a house and then give us that money and I give it back to the farmer. So it's almost like a, a quick exchange. We're solving two problems. I'm solving government's problems with housing. And then I'm also solving the farmer's issue because he's going to buy it now, but he will get his money back. So, yeah, it's, so, so it's, it's, it's no one loses. That's something I've never heard of. Have you heard of that? No, I didn't know that. I didn't know about that. It's interesting, and it's it's it, as you say, it solves the problem. It does. So a lot of people don't know about it because, like I say, because I focus on agriculture, I'm always looking for a loophole. I'm always talking to government as well. So I don't just deal with farmers. I'm constantly in conversation with um, the different departments, whether it's water and sanitation, environmental, agriculture, and, and rural de development. Um, so I also get ideas from them, you know, where they say to me, okay, but what about this, Kati? Do you know that we have this fund, Kati? And I use it, you know, then I'm like, great, can I use it? <laughs> you know, can I have it, please? You know, um, so, uh, but then because it's my day to day, I would know about these things because I'm talking both sides. I'm talking to the farm and I'm also talking to government constantly about everything, you know, yes. and I'm looking for loopholes, you know, so I'm constantly looking for solutions. I don't go to court. I'm not an admitted attorney, so I, I can't go to court for anybody, you know, so I always say to farmers when they come see me, I'm like, look, if you're looking for a fight, right, I'm the wrong lawyer, right? If you're looking for solutions, yes, because I don't like court. I want to, to find a solution that is fair because like I say, I'm on both sides, you know, I get the story of the farm workers. I feel very bad for them. And I think more people should feel, feel bad for them to, to really think about it, that where are they supposed to go if we just go 
cool you know um, and then also from the farmer's side i feel for them as well because they're running a business it's not a charity you know and they're also trying to be um successful and and to keep you know uh, farming you know which is in the end good for us as normal consumers because we need um sustainability when it comes to food you know which is an issue as well you know as we know so um yeah i think yeah that's the umbrella i could carry on <laughs> thank you but it all yeah but it all rolls you it know does, it yeah. does connect and in the Paul area, a lot of the farmers that you would probably be me meeting are people that are producing fruit for the export market. Mm -hmm. And one of the one of the issues that our export market has is market access, which is also a government issue. Mm -hmm. So um, that is one of the ways that government could could help our mm -hmm. farmers more. Is there anything else that you could potentially discuss about um, how? our government is or isn't supporting farmers. Mm, mm. I, and I, and I'm probably going to get into trouble for saying this. I sometimes think our government doesn't understand our industry at all. You know, um, I think they have some people that are just not qualified to understand what we are talking about half the time. I think our minister's great, but it's a minister, right? So she is, the boss and she has delegated, you know, to different people across the different provinces and, and all of that. So I think sometimes some legislation is not well thought out. That's why it's easy then to take it to court and some farmers take it to court and immediately the court then strikes out that legislation and, and all of that. Um, I think they want to support farmers. You know, I think they understand the importance of our industry. I just think they don't understand it very well, you know, and they don't understand how it works. And I think it's Probably also because our government has a, a purpose, uh, uh, they're purpose driven in terms of the transformation story and all of that. So it's almost like sometimes they're blinded by, you know, this obsession that the agricultural sector has not transformed enough. It must transform. You know, we must see uh, women in agriculture. We must see black people in agriculture. We must see young people in agriculture. But getting that it's not that easy. It's not that simple, you know. Um, a lot of talks I've had with black farmers um, who I've been invited to talk, I keep saying to them that sometimes you, I think I get the impression sometimes that black farmers think, some black farmers, not all, we have a lot of successful black farmers, but talking young, inexperienced farmers um, that are very eager and interested in the industry, that they think it's an overnight game you know and they think that it's a one generation game you know and all of my clients that are multiple multiple generational farms it took them about three or four generations to get it to look what it looks like now yes. <laughs> you know yes. so some of these beautiful farms that we're seeing here in the winelands for example um it did not happen in one generation for it to look as beautiful you know so when you have uh, political parties coming to the western cape and saying oh look you know look in, they live in luxury and look how beautiful um it didn't look like that you know 50 years I, ago I, 100 I, years I, ago i, I saw a, uh, um, a cartoon it was in the burger, but this is many years ago when mm. I still bought the burger. And it was this farmer standing at the fence and, and these workers standing next to him. And, and the, the caption was, so the government wants to come and take half my farm. Mm. Which half of the <laughs> debt are they going to take as well? Exactly. And that's another thing. I mean, let's talk about that. You know, a lot of people think farmers have money, right? Farmers are indebted to you know, no tomorrow, you know, I mean, if you look at Wendy's and you look at their properties, they owe the bank a lot of money, you know, it's not farms that just in because it's been cases. in most cases, um, it's not just because the farm has been in their family for three, four generations, doesn't mean that they own it outright, that tomorrow they can sell and they're going to make some crazy profit, you know, off the land. A lot of them are owing the bank for that land, you know, that and, land and is still, you know. What we've also seen lately is that there's a lot of private investment happening mm. on farms mm. a grower wants to build a new pack house yeah. but the but the the bank doesn't want to give him the 100 million rand mm. loan mm. so he mm. gets a private investor yeah, that, too. Too. Yeah. That, that as well mm. that, that's also debt mm. and foreign money you and know so you money. have a lot of mm. foreigners now so I, for some reason in the last year for example a lot of my clients are foreigners you know so foreigners is in foreign companies sitting in spain sitting in italy right investing here because again the competition and i think that's why i want to say to you our government doesn't sometimes understand our industry we are in very hectic competition with chile with mm. um the netherlands with you know for the same stuff blueberries 
all of that, yeah. you know. And what they're starting to do, because they have much more money and our rent is collapsing like it is, they're buying property it's here cheaper, yeah. in order to do the same blueberries for themselves to go back, you know, um, to, to their countries, right? Which technically, if they keep doing that, we're never going to have South African farmers anymore because they're just buying up all our lands and farming it for their own markets, you I know. I just had a friend of mine that went to this... Um, he had to go for a conference to the States and he flew into Washington and he sent me a message from the from the airport. He says, is there any farmers left in South Africa? I said, what do you mean? He says, no, it was just Afrikaans guys yeah. on, the, on the flight with this. Mm. Yeah, but those are not the farmers. Those are guys going to do farm work yeah. there. They're yeah, they're going to work, farmers, yeah. Farmers here. But if it, if it carries on, who says our people wouldn't go work yeah. overseas? No, sure. You know, we're going to maybe end up having no industry within agriculture of our own and it's foreign owned you know and i mean that maybe that's fine for great invest direct investment into the country all of that but they're not doing it for us they're not doing it for the food sustainability of south africans yeah. they're doing it for themselves because they are also capitalists all right so they're making sure that if blueberries is winter in their side of the world so they can't do their blueberries well they have farms here so they can continue blueberrying mm. here which technically means they're doing blueberry farming the whole year all right exactly so now, that brings me to the question that we were talking about, is that the, the new laws that government is planning to implement, mm. which will affect the, our existing agricultural mm. sector and any foreigners mm. about the water, about the proposed water law. Yeah. Yeah. That's how we got here in the first place. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, yeah. Why we set this whole thing up. Is, is, uh, what you've just added, it even mm. adds another aspect to it. Do mm. you want to unpack that mm. for us, please? So, yeah, so this water... Act is a, a bill now that's being proposed, right? And we have a few days to discuss it and send bank comments. Uh, but the way I read it, I think they've decided, you know, it's going to go through. I think personally, I think it's just, they just ticking the box that a public participation was done, you know, on it, you know, because it's too specific and too, um, well written all right to make me think that this is still just proposed all right i think they've they've decided that that's where they're going with it the biggest issue i have with it is the race quota that they've put in let's call it a race quota so um they basically said that if you want more than i think it's 50 hectares i'd have to check but They've put numbers in terms of how much water you apply for. And if you apply for X amount of water, it means you must have 25% uh, black ownership of yes. your farm. In the water that applies for that water. Mm, mm. Okay. And then they increase it per how much water you, you might ask for. And it goes all the way up to 75%. 75% means that you don't own your business anymore. That's a very dangerous number. You know, even for me, I mean, I own my business 100%. Saying to me, I have to give to somebody 75% of my business. I might say to you, they're now closing. It, it's, you know? it's not a problem to give 75% away, but what are they bringing to the table? Okay, so I'm going to get to that, okay. right? Because now... I've heard some bizarre things since this bill came out, right? So, so there's that, right? And I think that's very scary generally for anybody, even me. 75% of my business is not negotiable, right? Because it yes. means I don't own my business anymore, right? And regardless if a person is bringing uh, some sort of skill, talent, whatever, it has to match, right? So a lot of the conversations that I had in the past about BE and um, all of that within the agriculture sector is that I never understood farmers that go into relationships with black partners, but the black partner is sitting in Santon and he, he's He's an he's like an accountant in Santa. He works for a, Deloitte. To name on a piece of paper. <laughs> exactly. I never got that because when trouble comes, right, he cannot help you, right, and you look like you're fronting, you know. And who's more in trouble, the black guy or you? It's it's going to be the farmer, right, the white guy, you know, because he'll be accused of fronting, right. Then everything goes away. All those compliances that you know you're working so hard to get because of this relationship you have. Um, falls away because you've now been accused of fronting. That's the first thing. So I never understood how, you know, and why would you do that? It's like me saying um, a teacher can be my partner because 
they're white, you know. Yeah. What do you have to do with my business, you know? And you can't be sitting in Vusta while I'm sitting here working every day, you yes. know, and you are my partner and I pay you, right? But to be fair, I've always made jokes that I don't know why anybody doesn't make me partner. I'd love that life where I sit and send <laughs> and you pay me every month and you just wanted my name. But it is ridiculous. I find that very ridiculous, you know, and I'm very, very against that. I do believe there are a lot of partnerships that have been successful between white and black people, but the only ones I've seen that have been successful is when somebody's contributing equally towards the enterprise of what they're doing, yeah. right? Both Whether working it's actively at it. actively working, you know? So if I own a farm with you, why am I not on the farm? Why are you on the farm and I'm not on the farm, all right? And maybe I'm, I'm a female, I don't know how to harvest, but I can help, I'm a lawyer, all right? So that will be my job, all right? To make sure all our compliance is done, then there's no need for a cutly. You yeah. don't need to call Katika because, you know, we have an in-house lawyer whose job as my partner as well is to make sure that all our compliance is done, complete, sit on the phone with government, apply with all these forms you have to do, keep up with legislation and all of that. And you're doing it in-house like any other company, you right? Yeah. Like in-house, like you said, with children, you know? I mean, if I had a farm and I've got two children, when they grow up, I might say, you become a lawyer, you become a marketer, right? Because I'm going to need that, right? I need someone to do all our marketing and I need someone who's a lawyer to fight all my all my things, exactly. you know? And, and, and then it's in-house and why would I hire lawyers? I hire lawyers when it's something serious that advocate high them. court, blah, 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 that's above them. But the day-to-day -day legal compliance that um, you'd need, then get a partner like that, a black partner like that, you know, so it must make sense, you know? So that's the first thing. The second thing is that since this bill has come out, it's not come out, but the rumors, everybody's scared. So there's these weird foundations, NGOs, MPOs that are um, linked to struggle Star Wars that are dead, by the way, right? So it's like, if, you know, I don't know, I don't want to name names, but you know, you know what I'm talking mm. about, right? Um, so the Star Wars is dead. You are the grandchild of this Star Wars, this hero. Um, and you have a foundation and now they are approaching farmers and saying, this is going to happen, but let us be your partner. You pay us 18%, some story. Like, so they have a whole story and a plan about business plan. a business plan of how it's going to work. And then don't worry, we won't um, involve ourselves with your day-to-day -day, um, stuff. That is guaranteed to fit. Right. It's going to it's going to work now in the beginning. Right. And everybody's going to rush to it because they are so excited. Right. But the government's not stupid. Right. We've done BE, we've done fronting, we've done all of that, you know, so they will ask questions to say, oh, this is great. So the this foundation is your partner. Yeah. You gave them 75 percent. What do they bring to the table? What do they do for you? You know, which part of the business are they involved in? You know, because I think the days of blatant fronting and blatant nonsense between white people and black people in terms of trying to get things, all right, is over, you know, because mm. we've seen it. We're not stupid, you know, mm. and some people will probably say, look, I'm not sure I want to do business with you because I don't understand your black partner, you know. But, but also, sorry to interrupt you, it's, it's that currently as it sits now with the markets being the way it is, there just isn't margin in it, in it for any export farmer to give an extra 18% mm. away. Because they would much rather invest that in, into upgrading their current systems or mm. looking after the people or, or, or sustainable packaging mm. or whatever the story is. But mm. to just give 18% or 20 or 75 or however yeah. much away, mm. it's, it's simply not economically viable. It's not. Unless you're a fool. <laughs> Think so. Well, so how do you, what do you see the consequences of a law like this if it get, does, if the bill is um, passed? What do you see the consequences for our agricultural sector, yeah. um, having dealt with the people in the agricultural sector and having seen who's out there? Yeah, I think, you know, it's... it's, 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 yeah, it's sorry. Trying to interrupt you again. Does this only apply when, okay, I want to buy a piece of land, be it in Paul, the Dorans, Dos Rafi, wherever. Mm. So if I drill a borehole, do I have to apply, comply to all of this? For the underground water, or is it just for runoff water? Mm. If I build a dam on a catchment of rainwater, I, mm. I'm just curious because I don't know. Yeah. How, how, how does it work? Yeah, how so, does that all fit Yeah, in? so basically, it's okay. A borehole depends how much, how much you're drilling, how much you're going to take out. So what they've said basically is that you will not get water 
right? If you are not compliant, right, in terms of these quotas, if you are asking for this amount of water. So how it affects our industry is that we're not talking about um, Oma, you know, Tani and Um, who, who, who's just doing some small little thing, right? We're talking about our proper mega growers. You know, they immediately, like they immediately affect them, right? Because they'll never ask for um, 500,000 cubes of water alone. They'll ask for a million, you know? And a million cubes of water immediately puts them on the 75% story, right? So it's, it's more about how much are you taking out, you know, and versus not necessarily what you're doing. You know, and they're saying they won't give you the water license, right? If you don't comply with them. And and is this only is this on new developments going forward or on the current business yeah. as it is? So I would I would argue normally that it can't be retrospective, right? So it will be now going forward if from the time that the bill is introduced and it's it's accepted um, by the or signed by the president. Um, see now I forgot my legal terms about what happens when a president signs. It's called a not repealing, it'll come back to me. Anyway, when the president signs the, the bill and it comes into law and it comes into effect, then from then on, we'll be dealing with these issues now about new developments. And um, it cannot work, work retrospectively, that would be unfair, you know? So yes. currently, even with the new, the act, the current act that we have, it doesn't work retrospectively. So there are a lot of farmers that I just go to the department and say, listen, this dam has been there since 1950, right? So it doesn't count with this new act. So um, you have to let them operate as if we're still in 1950, you know, you cannot um, put this new act and the license issues on them when it was there already. You know? So it won't, I don't believe it will work retrospectively. Okay, another question. But the consequences, I mean, I asked and then we, mm. there were questions Sorry. on top of it. Mm. If this gets, if this bill becomes an act and it is, it is enacted to our uh, legal framework, yeah. what do you foresee? Personal opinion, um, I foresee a lot of corruption. Right. So I foresee a lot of, you know, there's parts of this country. I don't just work in the Western Cape. I work all over. And there's, you know, parts of the country where there's outright corruption of desperate farmers being told by officials that if you give me X amount, I'll make sure your license comes through. So I see corruption. I also see um, farmers giving up. All right. Because it's not worth it for them. Right, to, to do that. And some of them are old, you know, so for them, they can look at it and say, it's not worth the hack, right? And it's not worth the hack for my children either. So I'd rather sell, right? And have my kids do something else, you know? I see a lot of people leaving, a lot of young potential farmers leaving, you know, that could really have uh, been good for us to keep because they are the next generation that could skill the black farmers that want to come into into play, you and, know, and, which is and, very important. And with that generation, is it's it's my generation. Yes, they are. It is. They thirty to yeah. thirty to forty five yes. years old. Mm. The the his childhood friend, yeah. his little black and colored friend that he grew mm. up with, mm. has gone mm. to the same school, mm. has studied. Mm. It's, it's not like it was in the old days. Yeah. They are all like we've exactly, said. They're everybody's equal. equal. Everybody's equal, yeah. And that is exactly the the guy who should be in that business mm, at mm, that point. Exactly, you know. So it's funny that you say that. Um, it's exactly what I said a few weeks ago to someone that no, this whole story about it's been thirty years, so South Africa should have been okay by now. It's not actually true. Us in our thirties to about forty five are the first generation mm. of complete fairness, right? So it actually is the first time now, because we are the adults, right? We can put South Africa forward. So criticize us in 30 years that we didn't do anything because actually we were still growing up when we were still trying to figure out exactly. what's, what's to happen, you know? So we're the first ones that you and I are well-educated. We went to the same schools, right? We went to the same universities, right? No one can say somebody else is less completely look of course there's still poverty there's still people that are struggling to get educated and all of that but for the most part right this middle class we talk about in south africa is the first proper generation right yes. of potential change in this country right and we do not have the hang-ups of apartheid we don't have the hangover right we were just not there right and we were yeah. four or five years old when mandela was released right when mbiki came into power we were teenagers what did we know we couldn't even vote right there's nothing we've contributed so far until now <laughs> you know and for the first time this is our chance you know to see what can happen with south africa but the people spearheading it is still dinosaurs that's the problem. 
So in the same conversation with a client of mine in, in Hilton in KwaZulu Natal, and he's like, "Oh, Katli, I was in his bucky, and um, he doesn't have meetings in his office, so well, we drive around office. in the bucky and we're talking." <laughs> you know, so he's like, "Exactly." <laughs> <laughs> like, so he goes to me, oh, "You know, why don't you run?" You know, and I'm like, "It's very difficult when you know our." parties and all of them a and c d a you know um all of them have this tried and tested thing you know they don't want to resign you know so with the a and c you have people that are 70 80 years old right mm -hmm. our president is i don't know what is he 70 now or something mm -hmm. like that um yeah. in the da you have helen zilla right retired then not retired then back then she's chairperson you know and i don't understand that you know and there's no space then for us to come in if you're doing a method of tried and tested and how long you've been in the anc mm -hmm. and what struggles you went through um in the 80s and whether you're in angola or not you know i'm very respectful for um what the ANC did, you know, in terms of the struggle, in terms of fighting and, and all of that. But there comes a time also where they have to almost let go, you know, and, you know, in my opinion anyway, is that all these political parties need to be put in a museum somewhere. We take our kids every year to go see it. You know, we talk about <laughs> it. We're very proud of it. All right. And we move on. We get on with it, you know, because we're just not, we're just not that generation, you know, and I'd be lying if I said to you that, um, you know, the ANC must rule forever or the DA is perfect. In both of them, I that see very the, big, um, holes you know and and the problem with them is that then they allow smaller parties that are very very um dangerous in thought and in, in values to to possibly come in you know so and i think people don't understand voting and democracy in that sense that if you mess around with your vote because you are upset for example with one particular thing that this person did whatever and then you vote uh for an eff right your one vote could be the tipping scale that mm. makes Julius Malema our president tomorrow, right? So it's 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 a lot, all right? But like I say, I believe that our generation right now is the first generation. So I'd like to see South Africa in 30 years. But with, with legislation like this, where it could make people leave, give up, right? And leave the farms, we could end up, I'd never think South Africa could become a Zimbabwe, but we could end up with the so-called transformation bill where then they say, okay, then good. He's now selling the farm government. We are government. We'll buy it and we'll give it to a black person, right? Or a black yeah. group and you guys can farm it. And then they, they can't because they don't know what they're doing, you but, know? Okay. Here's, here's, a, here's another controversial question and Things that this is all stuff that crossed my mind when I'm standing either in the shower or laying in bed late at night and thinking about nonsense. Is that in a day and age like today, where you can, where a man can say he's a woman, a woman can say she's a man, and a, yeah. you can identify as a cart horse if you want to? <laughs> yeah. Who says if we go, Louise and I, who's both looking at us, we're white people, mm -hmm. go back in our family tree history. And see, there must have been a coloured slave yeah. mm. that's in our family tree. Mm. Mm. Who says we can't say no? But mm. because of that, I'm I'm a black person. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think that's the argument every South African can make, right? Exactly. Because every, every single you know, white person, it's in this every country. single white person in this country does have black ancestry in them, right? And it's actually not that far back. You know, it yes. can be traced relatively, you know, close. You know, um, and you know, same with black people. You know, um, so it, that is an interesting thing. I have thought about that, right? And sometimes when I talk to people, you know, it's it's interesting when you come from. Johannesburg and you come to a smaller town you think everybody thinks like you so I've learned a lot living here you know and I've changed my I still have the same mentality but I've I've added to my mentality you know because I've learned a lot but then I've also taught a lot to some people you know so you know part of being here is that you know there's this thing of colors all right mm. and colors calling themselves colors all right and then saying um you Africans, you know, so one girl, she works for um, a friend of mine and we're having lunch. She's an assistant to my friend. And she said, yeah, but you Africans, you know, so I was like, what do you mean by that? You know, and on the table, I was the only black girl or darker skinned person. And um, I said, so what do you mean by that? And she was like, no, you Africans as colored, blah, blah, blah. So I said, okay. That's great. I admit it. I am an African. You got me there, right? But what the hell are you? <laughs> right? If I'm African, what are you? You yeah. know? And I think, you know, just like what you just said, this whole debate around race, you know, is so stupid sometimes, you know. And she was mind blown when I said to her, Don't go around saying that. You sound very silly, 
right? Because anybody else outside of this country, right, either sees white people and black people, right, in, and mixing them with with colors as well, right? They do not see a colored person as some sort of in between. You yes. know, um, and I, I, she's young, so I wasn't too harsh with her, but I was educating her now, saying to really think about it. Don't go around saying silly things like that because you really sound stupid. You know, like it sounds like the dumbest thing I've ever heard. And same thing with the argument on race in this country. I'm not talking now about Germans and French people and, and all of that that are here now. I'm talking about South Africans, you know, born and bred yes. South Africans that can trace our, our roots back 10 generations if we have to. Yeah, to the settlers. We and are to the Africans. Yeah, we're Africans. You know, so the days of saying 400 years ago, they came, blah, blah, whatever, they came. Now they're here. They've never left, all right? And every single generation that is born here, all right, more and more of their blood is ingrained in this place, all right? We have a vested interest, all of us, all right? And we are all that, you know, we are all of what is South African, you know? So I, that's why I said to you earlier that I'm not sensitive about race because for me, race is not top of my mind of what your skin color looks like, you know, or how dark or, or light a person is, you know? And it's, it's interesting because I said to an English guy, a friend of mine, he lives in the UK. And I said to him, he was saying something about South Africa, I'm Afrikaners, you know? And he's like, oh, they're all over UK, blah, 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 whatever. And I'm like, yeah, but a lot of them are coming home now, you know? And the stats are saying a lot of them are coming home, which is great, you know? And he's like, yeah, but do they really fit in? I'm like, of course they do. They're very much part of our fabric and our soil, all right? And he's like, yeah, but they're actually more Netherlands, blah, blah. I'm like, no, they're not. They're South, they're South African, Afrikaner, they're Afrikaners, right? And he's like, why do you say that? I'm like, have you ever looked an Afrikaner properly, right? And he's like, what do you mean? I'm like, well, they're not as pale as you are, right? Mm -hmm. They most of the time, very tanned naturally, and their babies are born that way, right? It's not from the sun. They're born that way, right? So they've picked up the color, right? Um, have you looked at their eyes, right? The color of their eyes, right? And he's like, what color are they? I'm like, well, you pale ones are blue and all sorts of crazy colors. My Afrikaners, right, have green, right? either very piercing green eyes, right? You'll find some blue, but a lot of them are brown. Right. And where does brown come from, my darling? It comes from black people. Right. And it's a stronger eye color than all other ones. You know, so the minute you have a brown eye color introduced somewhere in the family line, it tends to to keep yeah. going. You know, so I, I was arguing with him and he started laughing. He's like, OK, you're right. I never thought of it. And I'm like, I'm like, exactly. Right. They are Afrikaans. They are not Netherlands. They are not German. They are not French anymore. You know, maybe 500 years ago, yeah. but not anymore. You know, they are, they belong here. They are here. I don't but know. You, but, but, uh, I'm sure you've traveled internationally. Mm. You, you spot the South African. Oh, from far. And that's what I said to him. I'm like, you can't, you can't hide South Africans from me because I can spot all of them. <laughs> right. And in London, just anyway. Look the, yeah. Just look for the fellas in the KW shirt. And you. <laughs> that too, our KW shirts, you know. But it's also like, and you see what's just funny about South Africans, whether they're white or black, when we are outside of our country, right, we have this crazy connection and love for one another, you know, in, in, and we find ourselves living in the same neighborhoods, black and white, it, it's, you know. Uh, it's a funny thing. I, I saw, um, I listened to something the other day where, they, where the people said, if you meet somebody from your own town, in a different place. You're excited to see them. Yeah. But you're not excited to see them when, when you walk you're down here. the street. Yeah. No, but it's a, it's a crazy thing. And I've seen it so many times, you know, where, and I think it's a nostalgia for, for home. And then I also think it's because deep down inside, right, we are very connected to this land. We are very connected to our country and we all equally love it right? Not, nobody loves it more. Black people don't love it more than a white person does, than an Afrikaans person does. And I sometimes don't even know where the English like come into play, but Afrikaans have a very strong connection to this country, you know, and I cannot imagine the heartbreak of losing, you know, what they do very well, right? Which is farming. Right. That's what they've done for generations, you know, so it's, it's a, it's a family business, you know, so it's like miners, miners are miners and they, I'm the only one in my family that's not in mining, right? But we've been in mining for a long time, you know, and you know, some families are, are butchers, right? And it's mm. in their family. That's what they do. That's what they know. You know, and, and it just continues like that. And I think it's, it's important to keep that in mind when we put these rules in that we cannot exclude one another when we are, each other, if that makes sense. You know, so. Indeed, and what you what you say actually really connects with the fact that it's not a it's not a compliment, but very often people refer to Afrikaans people. They call them a boor, 
Yeah. Which is a pharma. Which is yeah, a pharma. Kind of the, the it's kind of not the actually an insult. Yeah. Right? No. It's not an it interest. Refers, it, yeah. it refers to a profession, actually. Exactly. exactly. You know, and that's and that's what I'm saying. And that in terms of these consequences or potential consequences, you are killing not only an industry but a culture yeah. of a, a certain group of people in this country. You know, could could it be? And, and it's a controversial statement that I'm going about. That I'm going to make. Do you think that it could be a ploy by the current government to kill a culture? I don't know. <sighs> I don't know, our politics are so complicated, you know, because I don't believe the ANC is racist, right? I know so many people that are in the ANC that were there historically that are not racist, you know, and have no agenda with um, white people or black people, whatever. They just want everybody to, 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 to thrive, you know, and to do well, you know. But I think when you mix the amount of corruption we've seen within the ANC, of certain factions, you know, um, it muddies the water a lot that one would think that, what, do they have an agenda? You know, is it the whole political party that has an agenda? But I genuinely do not believe so, right? And I and I think also the NC is complicated in itself in that how do you have con communist, socialist, capitalist, you know, people of such different ideologies, you know, in one party? You know, I mean, the ANC was formed to, I always say this to people, the ANC was formed to kill an elephant called apartheid. They succeeded. They should have immediately broken up back into your, your different ideologies, right? Then we end up with, I don't yes. know, 20 different ideologies. And then let me decide as the voter, what do I believe in? Do I believe in communism? Do I believe in socialism? Am I a capitalist? Am I a this, you know? And maybe then we'd have a more of a fair, um, a democratic state, you know, instead of this one big party that is like a pendulum, right? Next year, it's somebody else and he believes in something else, then we have hope again. Then the following four years after that is someone else taking us right back to something else, you know, so it, it's yeah. difficult. Yes, it is. It but is I, very so I don't believe everybody in the ANC is, is against white people or wants the destruction of um, the white people and the industry as well. Yeah, no, definitely not everybody. No, yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's another topic. But, but from an days. agricultural perspective, this water bill, yeah. um, I would imagine it's actually creating quite a stir and, it's, it's a, and a lot stir. of people will be feeling very, very threatened by this. Mm -hmm. And um, your very honest opinion of what you think could happen, mm -hmm. we appreciate you sharing that. And <clears throat> what, 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 could, what could the people on the ground do? What can, what can the farmers do? What, what, how yeah. can they make this known so that this could possibly be stopped or mm. anything like that? I think, you know, when I got the bill, I started calling my clients, you know, so I started first with my clients, KZN, Mbomalanga, all of them. And I said, so listen to me and listen to me properly. Please do not panic. This is not law yet. And please do not get into any conversations with any black companies now approaching you for some deal, you know, like there is no deals to be made, right? It's not in law. Of course, people are going to challenge it, right? So when I got this, we got it from the Western Cape um, Department of Environmental and as professionals, we're allowed to give comments on what we think, you know, and then I spoke to other um, colleagues of mine. So I work a lot with engineering companies, water engineering companies, because I'll do the legal side, they'll do the studies and, and, and all of that. So they, they asked me, what do you think? I'm like, look, let's put together a document, all of us, you know, we're a few companies, let's put together one document and state our concerns with this thing and also how it will affect our work, you know, because... Mm. I'm not sure, I just think the government just made it very hard for me to do my job, you know, um, if people are upset and feel cheated, you know. And another consequence I can think of is that people would then just say, why do I have to do a water use license? I'm just going to take my chances Th that um, is one, that was and a question use water that. illegally, you know, yeah, screw but, but, the government. But, but, yeah. but okay, let's say, I think that the, the final date for comment on that thing is the 18th of July yeah. or something. Let's say it takes another six months to come in. What stops some of these mega growers? Mm. And there's many of them. You don't even need to. You can't even single out one. Mm. To now just go and build dams. Yeah. And, nothing. And, 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 and I hope they call me. I'm going to help them. <laughs> <laughs> so nothing. Oh, well, nothing that. stops them. <laughs> but but um, just to build dams, and then when the EIA comes in and says, "Oh, sorry, Mister." Pochen pool, yeah. the years of 500,000 rand fine, mm. pay the fine, get it mm. over with, but at least in... The, it, yeah, there's a problem with that. There's a criminal prosecution site. 
So I actually have a client that um, the department criminally prosecuted. So okay, a so fine plus a criminal prosecution. Okay. And it, it, you, it's a fine plus jail time, you know. So it has a little bit of, um, you wouldn't do that. It's not a okay. good idea. What I would say is that immediately get your water rights in place properly. Let's get our licenses now before this, the, the, this the, act. The next question that I was thinking about, okay, so let's say the guy says, listen, I'm not gonna, I'm hot full of this whole thing. I just wanna get out, I wanna sell my farm, mm. take whatever money I can get from, from it and go sit by the sea. Now I come, I wanna buy that farm. Mm. Does that, will that bill then impact me as a new buyer? If it's or? already in effect, yes. If it's a, so if I didn't come in, yet there's already been water rights established on a property, mm -hmm. will it then will no. that fall away? So, it, so we have to hope that the guy that's selling has got all his stuff together and he has the license because licenses last 20 years. So if he already has a license for that dam, for example, all we're going to do is a change in title mm -hmm. on the license, you know, so, so it's two parts. Buyer, make sure that things are in place so you don't have issues, right? Otherwise you're starting the process with me or current owner, just make everything fine. Just make sure you've got your licenses, everything's and if, fine. If and then I buy the farm now and there's 18 months left on the water lease. We're going to renew it. Is it? Mm. But, but, you must, but, but you see, it goes part to what I do also as a living that I have to tell the farmers that, hey, these things are not forever, you know, and if you want to keep this water, let's renew it and let's start now, right? So it's already lodged, you know, because you wait too long, then maybe this bill comes into play and they say, ah, oh, wait a minute, you know, there's a new law, you know? So little things like that goes into basically what I do, you know, to keep them abreast of, of these things and saying, hey, your license is about to, to end, you know, let's renew quickly, you know, and then it's not the whole rigorous process again, we're just renewing, right? And we're not adding more water, we're not doing it, then we're just renewing our license, you know, our legality, basically, of, of our water, so. It's fascinating. Okay. Is anything there's a else lot. That, anything else that you want to add? We could a, talk. A, no, there's so much. We could talk all day. Yes, you know, indeed. there's so it's much very, about very it, and yeah, and I mean, all of it can even be sliced up. And we were talking generally now. You know, all of it can literally be sliced mm. up into subjects by themselves. You know, so. But we can um, do that. I think it would be. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, there's always a lot. I think yeah. that one of the, the most urgent issue that or timeliest issue that mm. we wanted to dis to hear your opinion on mm. was the bill. And you've you've really given us your opinion on that, and and it is an expert opinion, mm. and a, and your own, as you said, mm. your personal opinion, mm. and we hope that um, there will be public participation and that there will be a reply on that, because I think this, if it will be to become an act, I think it's going to jeopardise a lot of of mm. our agricultural sector's mm. development. No, it will. It will stunt it immediately, you know, because mm. some people might leave, some people might quit. Some people might feel like, okay, let's do some funny corruption stuff and all of that. But all of those have consequences as well. You know, if you're caught out, then it's a big issue, you know, like then you've lost everything, you know, so it's not worth it mm. in the end to put people in that position of, of desperation. But then at the same time, I'd say to people that be smart about it. Don't react so quickly. You know, first of all, we're still doing the public participation. We haven't sent our comments in yet. We don't know if when it will be in, you know, so it's not time to make rash moves at the moment. Um, and then also it's a time to reflect actually and look at your stuff, like how far are you with your water and what's going on? You know, yes. are you even compliant at the moment? You know, because if you're not and this bill comes in, it means we're now participating with the new bill, you know, because mm. you are not, you haven't even done anything, you know? Mm. So I think it's just maybe a wake up call as well that people must just be, look at your stuff, like get your stuff together, you know, and we can, we can sort it and, and try work it out. So, yeah. Okay. We've got a little parting tradition where the previous guests ask a question for the next one. Okay. They don't know who it is. They okay. don't know. They got a question. They don't know who that comes from and we're going to get one from you as well. So the question was, is, do you have any, and it fits actually very nicely in with your sustainability aspect. Do you have any solution for the plastic problem in the agricultural industry? Uh, do I have a solution? Have you plastic? thought about this or is it? I actually have. I, I have a little bit. Um, sp I'm told, I'm thought about it, but more on the tire side, not plastics. You know, what do you do with tires? Oh, yes. You know, but anyway, uh, 
yeah, the waste industry is very interesting in this country because you have the formal government structures, but then you also have these gangs of waste. You know, like if you go to these big, um, what are they called? Where we, where we all throw the out the dumps. Yeah. There's little gangs there. You can't just walk in there and just start taking stuff saying you're going to recycle. They have their own system as well going on there and their own <laughs> yeah. economy going on there. And, you know, you'll get beat up. You can't just rock up. You know, you must no. talk to the head and get permission and then tell them what you want and pay them sometimes, you know, to take whatever it is you want to, to take. So I think if you formalize groups like that, because already they have semi-formalized themselves, you know, because I know for a fact that dumps are not a place you just cup, you know. Mm. And so probably formalizing them a little bit more um incentivizing them a little bit more um and formalizing also where recycling happens you know we don't recycle enough in in this country our homes very few homes i know recycle and actually separate and and all of that so uh and, that then, would be, and then is it actually does it actually go to a recycle facility once the municipality well, picks that's it up? the thing you know so you i don't think know it does. And i think it does but then why do we have dumping size so huge you know and it's full of plastic and all sorts of things and that's where you get those guys then actually taking it out and taking it to recycling um, plants and, and to get a bit of money and all of that. So I would say maybe formalizing them, but like helping them properly to formalize themselves. They're already doing it, you know, and maybe as society helping them by sorting, you know, the stuff already. So it doesn't have to be picked out um, yeah. on, a, on a dumping site. So yeah, that would be my thoughts on that. Kati, thank, thank you, you very, very much. Thank this has you. been incredibly insightful and it's taken us into a direction that we haven't often been before and it's really given us food for thought. And thank you so much for making your time available. And I think this is not the, this might be the first time we met, but it won't be the last. Oh, I look too. forward to seeing you guys. Maybe next time I'll go over the mountain. <laughs> I'll come join you guys that side. I love that so highway. The wind has got a beautiful view from a stoop. Yeah. Oh, and I love stoops. It's my oh, favorite no. thing. <laughs> I think we'll talk again. Yeah, definitely. Thank, Thank you so, so much. much.